Hello everyone! I've taken some time to dive deeper into the presentations at BlizzCon and the interviews that came after to bring it all together into what hopefully is going to give you a clear understanding for what they're doing with the story of Warcraft for the next expansion and beyond. There's quite a lot of cool stuff to talk about, so much so that I can't dive into every little detail in just this video. But by all means, if there are things that you want to know about, let me know in the comments down below and I'll see what I can do. With that intro out of the way, let's dive into the World Soul Saga. It has been interesting this past year being back under the hood of World of Warcraft. It has reminded me of a few things. One, I love Warcraft. Number two, you know what? I really missed this work. And number three, on the real, it feels amazing to be back and part of this Blizzard family again. And Stickney, senior narrative designer, explains in an interview with Wowhead that while they were jamming with Chris, he came up with so many ideas that there were just too many to try and cram into one expansion. So why not make three out of them, have a framework, a direction in mind as to where they want to take the story. A storyline that in almost every way <laughs> feels like the culmination of the first 20 years of our storytelling. A storyline provided we, we do our jobs, we do the thing, <laughs> that will vector us into the next 20 years of adventure. At the expansion of Legion, Sargeras left us a little gift. His sword that was aimed at striking down the soul of Azeroth. The Dark Titan feared that a world that had been infected with the old gods, that it could give birth to nothing but destruction. A corrupted titan that would consume the universe. Not everybody agreed, including his fellow titans. They worked hard to contain the threat of the old gods, put machines to work to get her spirit growing. Her defenders, children of Azeroth and more, they have saved her time and time again, including against the Dark Titan himself. The wound inflicted was healed during the expansion that followed, during Battle for Azeroth. Even the last old god Nazoth fell to her might, meaning that since for the first time the old gods had crashed into a surface, Azeroth been cleansed, the world soul song has been ringing true, she has been healing, growing stronger and stronger, reflected in the elements and the dragon elves waking up. It's in the expansion Dragonflight, where we see Iridacron, primal incarnate of Earth, team up with the time-traveling infinite Dragonflight. They've gone back in time to the corpse of Calagrond, which was mutated by the old god Yaxaran. They've sucked out something, some kind of essence from the slain, mutated primal dragon. Time's going to tell what exactly he managed to do here, as the relic that he used somehow ends up in the hands of Zolotov. We're gonna get a storyline, a patch to bridge the Dragonflight into the next expansion. Now Zolotov is a harbinger of the Void, but of course, her full intents and her full plans are still to be revealed. Details to come. Right now, I imagine that she's gathering the power of the Old Gods. There's mention of the blood of the Old Gods, so there's plenty of Void power to go around. The darkness is growing, while at the same time, Azeroth is getting stronger. Her voice is calling out not just to those with a strong connection to the world, people like Vral, a very powerful shaman, but so many more can hear her voice now, like Enduin Rin, a radiant song as Illyria Windrunner describes it. They don't instantly know who or what is talking to them, what is going on, but don't you worry, we'll hear all too familiar voice. Champion! Champion! Azeroth's dying! Heal her! Heal her! Heal her! Champion! Let's get to it! Magni was once the king of Idaforge, but then he went through a ritual and became one with the earth. Upon awakening, he was known as the king of diamonds, leaving everything he once knew behind, his city, people and daughter Moira, to be Azeroth's voice and saver during battle for Azeroth. It will be a great help with understanding what the heck's going on, guide us deeper into Azeroth, into that war within, not just in the literal sense, as in we're going to be fighting a war within Azeroth, it's also in a more metaphorical way. A lot of characters have inner strife and turmoil to deal with, the, the trauma of Anduin for his dealings in the Shadowlands, Illyria and the Call of the Void fighting against their nature. For all trying to find his new place within the world and the hordes, I'm sure that plenty more are going to be added. The world of Warcraft has plenty of conflict to go around. So let's go down below. Let's go find that war within. 
four new zones to explore at launch. And the cool part is uh, that they've designed it in such a way that there's a free flow to it as you go lower and lower, similar to what they've done with the Zarlek caverns within Dragonflight. It also won't all look like you're walking around in a dark cave underneath the earth. There are plenty of places that have a light source going on, be it lava, a ginormous crystal, or candles you're not supposed to take. Eight dungeons will be there at launch, four for leveling, and four at max level. The general name for the area, that is Kaz Algar, that's where we're gonna go, designated as Sector AR938 within the Observational Report Irvin. This is a book that we found within the revamped Ulderman dungeon at the start of Dragonflight. That's where the speculation came from, and the report written by Watcher Melania, it makes mention of dispatching a group of Irvin to investigate the fissure detected within this sector, a geological anomaly. But while they were performing their duty, these Irvin began to manifest behaviors analogous to those who would one day be apparent in the cell-styled dwarves, despite the two groups being separated by vast swaths of time and distance. In fact, based on their origin dates, they could identify no corollary at all between these populations. Yet while their behaviors, language and demeanor show many similarities, for example, name it a sector Kas Algar, physiology, the two groups remain distinct. Is this distinctiveness due to the exposure to unique qualities of the anomaly? Or is there another reason? We require some more data before a conclusion can be reached. Our dwarfs that we know, they have their origin as Irvin, but they became infected with something called the Curse of Flesh. This curse originates from the old gods and was designed to weaken some of the titanic creation. It literally gave them flesh, made them more vulnerable to the corruption of the old gods. A nice little side effect is that this corruption, or evolution you might call it, it is what would allow several races to rise up beyond their initial programming and actually cleanse the world without destroying her at the end of Battle for Azeroth, something that not even the titans themselves were able to do. In the case of the Irvin sent to this sector, they appear to be showing similar signs as art dwarfs, despite being so separate from each other. The report wonders if it could be the anomaly that's responsible for this. And while we don't know for sure yet what this anomaly is, we do know that there's going to be a shiny big crystal in one of the zones. A crystal which swaps between light and darkness, light and void? Question mark. Could the radiance of this crystal have had a similar yet different effect? Time is going to tell, as with most things I'm going to be talking about today. Now the similarities don't just stop with the evolution or name of the place either. Our dwarves were once ruled by one king commanding three different clans. Bronzebeard, Wildhammer and Dark Iron. The death of the king meant civil war, the War of Three Hammers, which was won by the Bronzebeards, and it meant the separation of the clans. Fast forward into the future, and we would see Magni Bronzebeard rule the Bronzebeard clan from within Idaforge. His daughter Moira was kidnapped by Dagran Fauruzan, Dagran being the leader of the Dark Iron Clan. Heroes were asked to take care of business and liberate his daughter. But little did he know that she actually loved Fauruzan. He showed her the respect that her father failed her to give just because she was born a woman. So she wasn't exactly happy with dear old dad. Long story short, she would eventually return home with a child. The heir to both the Dark Irons and the Bronzebeards. Moira became part of the council that now rules Forge, Forging a future for her son and bringing the clans closer together. In time, my son shall rule the Dark Irons. And perhaps all Iron Forge as well. Wouldn't you know it, Moira and her now somewhat grown-up child are gonna play their part within the expansion. Reflecting this to the Irvin of Kas Algar, we once again find three different clans who are at odds with each other. Originally, they all started out as following the edicts of the Titans, following the code of their creators. But they've been gone for a really long time, so some of the Irvin, they've started to change. The Osworn are those that still hold faithfully to the Edicts. They guard the Coreway, which is a titan passageway that leads directly into the core of Azeroth. They're the ones living within the capital city, they live near the object of the responsibility, and they see anyone that do things differently as doing it wrong. The Unbound have just abandoned their edicts, and they're seen as quite scandalous by the Osworn. They used to provide materials to keep their Titan facilities supplied, so that's where we'll find them, near quarries and mines where those resources can be gathered. They rarely interact with the city dwellers, as they feel neglected and ignored for having a different opinion on how they should live their lives. And then the machine speakers, who were strayed away from the edicts in practice, but not completely. 
and they're still trying to uphold the obligations to keep the Titan works functioning. But as times change, they sometimes had to think outside of the box to keep things going. They have extremely limited contact with surface dwellers, and a great disdain for those that don't understand their great machines. Their homes are built around vast industrial projects underneath the surface, which allows them to, you know, more or less perform their functions according to the edicts. Their difference of opinion and the problems within their society. It's something that we're gonna have to deal with. Not to mention that their numbers are dwindling. For some reason, they can't reproduce or no new units are being created. That's gonna be something we'll have to sort out. And then we ourselves can play as the Irvin, part of either the Alliance or the Horde as a brand new allied race. So Kaz Ogar is the general name for the area. Diving deeper into the four specific zones, we've got the Isle of Dorne being our first zone on the surface. Which, looking at the artwork, it reminded me a lot of the Ares Peak and the burrows from Twilight Highlands. Some of the elemental rooks serve the Osworn, turning them into Storm Riders, one of the guardian warriors of the Urban people. The homes they used to live in have fallen a little bit into disrepair, so some other creatures have taken up residence, and we're gonna hang out in their capital city of Dornagal. Go lower, and you enter the ringing deeps, amply named for the sounds ring from the caverns as the urban toil away. This is where we'll see huge, complicated machines maintained by those machine speakers, but as times are changing and the numbers are dwindling, they'll need to find new ways to keep up their charge. In the meantime, other races take advantage of the weakened states, and they take over. Kobolds, for example, they're not just the cutesy kind that we know with the no-take candle. These kobolds have found a way to the gym, and now they're the ones taking the candles. My mind did shoot back to a small side quest back in High Mountain during Legion, where the kobold candles were also keeping the darkness, keeping the void at bay. From ringing deeps, we go lower into Hollowfall. And while you might expect this place to be shrouded in complete darkness, quite the opposite is true. In the sky, there's that massive crystal, and they've made it clear that it's not the tip of Sir Garrus's sword. We also know that it swaps between light and dark, details to be revealed. Right now, it reminds me a lot of the Naru. When a Naru, a creature of light, falls ill, it will fall to a void state. Now so far, the crystal has always managed to turn itself back on. So far, anyways. But the longer, darker periods, it's given creatures of darkness the opportunity to rise up and claim more to territory. The enormous cavern is bordered by an endless underground sea from which terrifying creatures emerge to wreak havoc. So there's watery creatures of the deep, perhaps some murlocs or some naga floating around. We haven't seen the Queen Ajara in quite a bit. Last time, we just let her walk out of Nyalofa, and that was that. There's also the Nerubians on the attack, so plenty of darkness skittering in the shadows. At the same time, this crystal has provided the area with so much light that vegetation had a chance to grow. You almost feel like you're back on the surface. Under the light, we find powerful worshippers of D-Light. These are ancient old Arafi people who have found a way here in a mysterious way. These are a splinter tribe of the original Arafi Empire from way back in the day. Now similar to how the Irvin became the dwarves under the influence of the Curse of Flesh, the Vraiku also changed. They became the early humans, and they would set up the Empire of Arator, the Arafi Empire, the first great human civilization under the leadership of King Foradin. This mighty empire would eventually split up into different little kingdoms like Lordaeron, Dalaran, Kaltiris. You get the idea. The group down below here is part of a kingdom that splintered and went across the sea. Through a vision, they learned about a falling star, which again, it rings like an Aru. This took them to Harrowfall. Who they are and what they're all about, we're going to find out. Safe to say that the light plays a big part in their society. They got beacons of light keeping the darkness away. Their airships are fueled by sacred flame. And the wind's war within, it seems to have disconnected him from the light. So I imagine that these Rafi, they could show their way of thinking, their connection to the source. Like the dwarves, they too have a bit of division, a bit of war amongst the ranks which we can help out with. Another cool connection they could use, that would be the story of the Ashbringer. The Ashbringer is a weapon legendary. It's forged with a crystal by Magni Bronzebeard, and it has shown the capability to be an epic weapon for the light, but also corrupted and dark. The origin of this crystal is still quite mysterious, could be further explained. Perhaps the legacy of the Ashbringer could be passed on to our Anduin as he steps away from Priest the Paladin. Who knows? Once more, we descend lower into the final zone to talk about, Ashkahet, where darkness reigns, as this is where Zalatov, 
harbinger of a new era for the Void's dark machinations. She hangs out, and she has recruited some allies to her cause, which are the Nerubians. Not the undead variation that you might remember fighting during Wrath of the Lich King. These Nerubians are deadly survivors of the mythic wars which played out time and time again over thousands of years. The Nerubians are also creatures evolved under the influence of the old god Yuxeron. But the Black Empire has fallen. The old gods have been slain by Azrael's mighty champions. Zalatov knows this, knows our strengths, and works towards the rise of a new dark legacy. She has been very patient, and now recruits the Nerubians with the promise of a new future. They've been gathering the blood of the old gods, while also embracing new powers provided by Zalatov. Upgrades for those that the Queen of the Nerubians finds worthy. Now I could imagine that the relic filled with Galakron's essence, the transmutation caused by Yaxaron, that it could help further evolve his Nerubians. But not everyone in their spidery society is down with following the will of the Queen. Not all are up for signing for the powers of the Void, so get ready to earn the trust of some Nerubian allies. Their city of threats has been built on the ruins of itself. Over and over and over again, where some areas decay and crumble, new districts are built upon its ruins, and as a result, the city climbs ever higher. Within their society, those at the top, they're the ones favored by their queen, or they have power, or they have wealth, or all of the above, looking down upon the poor who can't afford a three-day early release. The burrows are home to the scavengers, they're forgotten, deep within decay and filth. Their Umbro Bazaar is a trading hub where you can trade fine silks, fascinating alchemy and hard to find goods. Another area which I think they called The Skeins are the home of the lore keepers. That will be my place to hang out in. It houses their lore keepers and scholars who toil to maintain the history of their people and research the myths and legends of Azeroth. More districts and less savory neighborhoods await to be discovered in the dark. This area is dominated by the spidery creatures, but there are more that have managed to survive. To live among them without being considered a threat, food, or a fun thing to torment. Oh yeah, and uh, they also keep bugs as pets. That's also what a first raid is going to be all about. Dealing with the Queen of the Nerubians. An A-boss raid in Ashkahet. The culmination of all those machinations between the Queen, the Nerubian Empire, and her collaboration with Zalatov. On the opposite end, there will be a rivalry between Zalatov and Illyria. Illyria Windrunner is the sister of Sylvanas Windrunner, who's currently serving her time doing Ma dailies in the Ma. And there's Vrisa Windrunner. Vrisa could usually be found in Dalaran, the city where Illyria goes to in the trailer. Now the war within Illyria that has to do with the Void. Unlike her partner Torellian, who is all about the light, Illyria was called to the Void. She was trained by the Locust Walker. She has absorbed the power of a dark Naru. Upon returning home, she visited the Sunwell, and her darkness caused quite the reaction. Their pursuit of Sylvanas pushed these two, light and darkness, to capture innocence, invade their minds. Visions of darkness surround the Windrunner, and yet balance is important. Really excited to see how her role is going to develop, and I could imagine a situation in which Sylvanas could return to offer guidance to her sister. Maybe not directly in the war within, maybe it's gonna be a Midnight or the final Titan. Not a lot can be said about those expansions quite yet, although it's crazy to think that the final Titan, the Dead is a Line, dropped all the way back in Mr. Pandaria. The heart of a king, the powers of a god. What are you doing? You're not seriously going to eat that. It is filled with titan magic. The very language of creation. Oh. I see them. A million, million worlds glittering in their perfection. But one above all others. Oh. Oh, we have fallen. We must rebuild the final titan. Do not forget. What are you trying to pull? It... it is gone. I don't remember any of it. Oh, none of them remember. The irony. What are you talking about? I don't trust you. You are wise not to. Not to make us all feel old or anything, but Mr. Pandaria was released in 2012. 
Now, the more I'm diving into this story, into the presentation, the more connections that are made to storylines build up within Legion and then played out a little bit in Battle for Azeroth and beyond. Now, I don't expect them to do a literal reset, but I do think that we're going to see them try incorporate what they've got and push it into a direction which they intended, if not intended, which will be better received. The idea of earth-shattering revelations on the Titans, their true motives being revealed to us, that's, that's something that we've heard before, but the new concepts didn't exactly land. I'm genuinely excited to see where this new direction, where these free expansions are going to take us. I've always said that I would have loved to have seen Azeroth wake up at the end of Battle for Azeroth. The Titans are going to return. The nature of Azeroth revealed. Could we lose now at the end of an expansion and so much more? I can't wait for the journey. The hype after BlizzCon is definitely real. Hopefully you're all up to speed now on some of the things that they've announced at the con and how it all could connect, the things that we've had in the story before, some plots that could play out. If there are any questions or if there are any subjects they would like me to dive deeper into, by all means, let me know in the comments down below. I've also updated my playlist and I plan to update a couple of the older videos. So yeah, there's, there's plenty to come. For now though, thank you very much for watching everyone. Subscribe if you like my videos, leave a like if you enjoyed this one, and until next time, see ya!